。下面这一段我我自己非常非常有感觉，所以我建议大家也是仔细听他的。今天的这三个东西的影片都有相当不错的内容。了解极限等于设计，这是什么意思？这位先生他说啊，我们人因为了解我们自己。没有办法从这个高度直接跳到那个高度，所以我们会设计楼梯，因为我们了解我们身体的局局限，我们要走得舒服，不要爬跳来跳去、爬来爬去，我们所以会去设计楼梯。我们自己知道我们不能站很久，所以我们会去设计椅子。我们知道我们自己呃这个呃。举例来说，不能走很远，所以我们会去设计轮子，所以我们会骑在上面走，可以帮助我们走路。所以这个都是因为了解我们设身体的局限。可是呢，我们通常在设计的时候，尤其是设计系统的时候，设计实体是因为我们为身体设计，可是我们很少为我们的思想去设计。我们的思想其实也有局限。但是我们忘了为思想做设计，所以我们才会有金融危机那种东西。就是金融危机是所有人都以为我们的脑袋是没有极限的，我们知道自己的脑、自己的身体有极限，所以有人告诉你说从三楼跳下来你已经不太敢了，从三十楼跳下来你根本不用想，你根本就会说他是神经病，所以你不会做这个事。可是我们的金融危机是因为很多人相信。有人告诉他说：“从三十楼跳下来会大赚钱。”所以这个系统的设计就是让你从三十楼跳下来。他告诉你说这样会赚钱，就大家就相信了，就这样去了。不然为什么后来有很多人套牢嘞？这个意思就是同一个意思啊。所以我们从这里来看设计这个概念。呃，他的今天要谈的题目呢，他是一个 behavior economics。就是这个行为经济学家，刚刚介绍过哈，就是我们是不是真的能够控制我们自己的决定？那显然他这么说就是不能喽。那我们来看看他是谁？我们介绍过 MIT 的行为经济学教授，看看他的影片。I'll tell you a little bit about the irrational behavior, not yours, of course, other people's. Uh, so um, after being at MIT for、uh, for a few years, 我先解释一下，他为什么脸会这样。他在十八岁的时候有一个那个煤的爆炸，煤不是煤矿的煤，化学药品那个煤爆炸，所以他全身着火，百分之七十灼伤，所以。他的网站上面，各位如果对于痛这件事情，人类经过痛苦能够有什么感受，能够有什么进步，他自己有一篇文章在他的网站上写的非常非常的好。他他描写他在烧伤的时候皮怎么掉下来，如何做手术等等等等。那你如果这个他把它写的很科学啊、哦，所以你可以去理解。呃，这位曾经受过非常辛苦的一个这个学者，呃，他的心灵成长的过程。那不过今天我们不是谈这个，我们是在谈行为科学跟经济之间的关系，跟设计有什么关系 ？I realize that、uh, writing academic papers is not that exciting. You know, I don't know how many of those you read, but it's not fun to read and often not fun to write, even worse to write. So I decided to try and write something、uh, more fun, and I、uh, came up with an idea that I will write a cookbook. <coughs> and the title for my cookbook was going to be "Dining Without Crumbs: The Art of Eating Over the Sink." <laughs> and it was going to be a look at life through the kitchen.、And、I was quite excited about this. I was going to talk about a little bit about research, a little bit about the kitchen. You know, we do so much in the kitchen. I thought this would be interesting. And I wrote a couple of chapters, and I took it to MIT Press, and they said,、uh, you know. Cute, but not for us. Go and find somebody else. I tried other people, and everybody said the same thing:、uh, cute, not for us. 
Um, until somebody said, um, look, uh, if you're serious about this, you first have to write a book about your research. You have to publish something, and then you'll get the opportunity to write something else. If you really want to do it, you have to do it. So I said, you know, I really don't want to write about my research. I do this all day long. I want to write something else, something a bit more free, less constrained. And this uh, person was very um, forceful and said, look, that's the only way you'll ever do it. So I said, OK, if I have to do it, I had a sabbatical. I said, I'll write about my research if there's no other way, and then I'll get to do my cookbook. So I wrote a, a book on my research. And it turns out to be quite fun in two ways. First of all, I enjoyed writing. This book you can also go to online. It's called Predictable. The irrational, 就是说可预测的非理性，基本上他就是认为人的很多的行为都是非理性。为什么要停下来跟大家讲这个呢？如果你是一个做设计的人，你知道你的业主做决定是非理性，你知道你自己做决定是非理性，那你就要非常的去。仔细的去理解这种事情是是什么意思啊？所以我想今天的这这个演讲呢，对我们是很有帮助的。Writing, but the more interesting thing was that I start learning from people. It's a fantastic time to write because there's so much feedback you can get from people. People write me about their personal experience and about their examples and what they disagree and nuances. And even being here, I mean, the last few days, I've, I've known really heights of uh, obsessive behavior I never uh, thought about, <laughs> which I think is just fascinating. I want to tell you a little bit about irrational behavior, and I want to start by giving you some examples of visual illusion as a metaphor for rationality. So think about these two tables. <笑>你真的看出来他是一样长吗 and you must have seen this illusion. If I ask you what's longer, the vertical line on the table on the left or the horizontal line on the table on the right, which one seems longer? Can anybody see anything but the left one being longer? No, right? It's impossible. Uh, but the nice thing about visual illusion is we can easily demonstrate mistakes. So I can put some lines on. Doesn't help. I can animate the lines. And to the extent you believe me, I didn't shrink the lines, which I didn't. I've proven to you that your eyes were deceiving you. Now, the interesting thing about this is when I take the lines away, it's as if you haven't learned anything in the last minute. You can't, <laughs> you can't look at this and say, OK, now I see reality as it is. Right? It's impossible to overcome this sense that this is indeed longer. Our intuition is really fooling us in a repeatable, predictable, consistent way. There's almost nothing we can do about it. <laughs> 我们的直觉一直在用我们现在我们都知道我们眼睛被骗了眼睛看的很容易证明给你看是你被骗。可是他很多事情他不能证明你被骗。他要讲的是这个。Aside from taking a ruler and starting to measure it. 
Here's another one. This is one of my favorite illusion. What do you see the color that the top arrow is pointing to? Brown, the brown thank you. The bottom one? Yellow. yellow. Turns out they're identical. Can anybody see them as identical? Very, very hard. I can cover the rest of the cube up. And if I cover the rest of the cube, you can see that they're identical. And if you don't believe me, you can get the slide later and do some arts and crafts and see that they're <laughs> identical. But again, it's the same story, that if we take the background away, the illusion comes back, right? There's no way for us not to see this illusion. I guess maybe if you're colorblind, I don't think you can see that. I want you to think about illusion as a metaphor. You know, vision is one of the best things we do. We have a huge part of our brain dedicated to vision, bigger than dedicated to anything else. Woman 耳朵听的呢？鼻子闻的呢？嘴巴呢？还有头脑自己想的呢？可想而知啊。We do more vision, more hours of the day than we do anything else, and we're evolutionarily designed to do vision. And if we have these predictable, repeatable mistakes in vision, in which we're so good at, what's the chance that we don't make even more mistakes in something we're not as good at? For example, financial decision making. Um, <laughs> Something we don't have an evolutionary reason to do, we don't have a specialized part of the brain, and we don't do that many hours of the day. And the, and the argument is that on those cases, it might be the issue that we actually make many more mistakes. And worse, not have an easy way to see them. Because in visual illusions, we could easily demonstrate the mistakes. In cognitive illusion, it's much, much harder to demonstrate to people the mistakes. <laughs> So I want to show you some cognitive illusion uh, or decision-making illusion in the same, in the same way. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite plots in social sciences. It's, it's from uh, a paper by Johnson and Goldstein. And it basically shows the percentage of people who indicate that they would be interested in giving their organs to donation. Here, and these are different countries in Europe, and you basically see two types of countries. Countries on the right, that seems to be giving a lot, and countries on the left, that seems to be giving very little, or you know, much less. The question is why? Why do some countries give a lot and some countries give a little? When you ask people this question, they usually think that it has to be something about culture. Right? How much do you care about people? Giving your organs to somebody else is probably about how much you care about society, how linked you are. Or maybe it is about religion. But if you look at this plot, you could see that countries that we think about as very similar actually exhibit very different behavior. For example, Sweden is all the way on the right, and Denmark, that we think is culturally very similar, is all the way on the left. Germany is on the left, and Austria is on the right. The Netherlands is on the left, and Belgium is on the right. And, and finally, depending on your particular version of uh, European similarity, you can think about the UK and France as either similar culturally or not. <coughs> But it turns out that uh, from organ donation, they're very different. By the way, the Netherlands is an interesting story. You see, the Netherlands is kind of the biggest of the small group. <laughs> um, turns out that they got to 28% after mailing every household in the country a letter begging people to join this organ donation program. Right, so you know the expression, begging only gets you so far? It's 28% in organ donation. <laughs> <coughs> 
But whatever the countries on the right are doing, they're doing a much better job than begging. 刚刚他说的那一个说荷兰为什么他们是在这个比较不想捐的人里面呢？他捐的比较多呢？这个是荷兰，在比较不想捐的人捐的比较多，是因为他们的政府写了一封信给所有的国民，说请他来参加器官捐赠，所以这么正式的邀请，二十八个 percent 同意。那这些国家到底是怎么做到有一百 percent 的人同意呢 ？So what are they doing? Turns out the secret has to do with the form at the DMV, and here's the story: the countries on the left have a form at the DMV that looks something like this. Check the box below if you want to participate in the organ donor program. And what happens? People don't check and they don't join. The countries on the right, the ones that give a lot, have a slightly different form. It says check the box below if you don't want to participate. <laughs> Interestingly enough, when people get this, they again don't check, but now they join. <laughs> the program. So this kind of difference. So we often talk about the census data. You can see it's like this. 意思是说，他问同一个问题，不一样的问法。你愿意把器官捐出来吗？大家都不填，所以就是表示我不愿意。你愿意？你如果不愿意把器官交出来，你就勾。结果大家还是不填，所以表示他愿意。所以那个一百趴愿意的，就是因为通通没填。他问这个问题，他就变成一百趴同意了。那所以这个是什么道理？他继续分析。我们一定会讲说啊，那就是这个是懒惰了，不肯勾了，不是。Now think about what this means. You know, we we wake up in the morning and we feel we make decisions. We wake up in the morning and we open the closet and we feel that we decide what to wear. And we open the refrigerator and we feel that we decide what to eat. And what this is actually saying that much of these decisions are not residing within us. They're residing by the person who's designing that form. When you walk into the DMV, the person who designed the form will have a huge influence on what you'll end up doing. Now it's also very hard to intuit these results. Think about it for yourself. How many of you believe that if you went to renew your license tomorrow and you went to the DMV and you would encounter one of these forms, that would actually change your own behavior? Very, very hard to think that it will influence us, right? We can say, oh, these funny Europeans. Of course, it would influence them. But when it comes to us, <laughs> we have such a feeling that we're in the driver's seat. We have such a feeling that we're in control and we are making the decision that it's very hard to even accept the idea. That we actually have an illusion of making a decision rather than actual decision. Now, you might say, you know, these are decisions we don't care about. In fact, by definition, these are decisions about something that will happen to us after we die. How could we care about something less than something that happens after we die? So, a standard economist, somebody who believes in rationality, would say, you know what? The cost of lifting the pencil and marking a V is higher than the possible benefit of the decision. So that's why we get this effect. <laughs> But in fact, it's not because it's easy. It's not because it's trivial. It's not because we don't care. It's the opposite. It's because we care. It's difficult and it's complex. And it's so complex that we don't know what to do. And because we have no idea what to do. This sentence is very important. 所以你给业主选东西的时候，你也要想这个事情。他刚刚的意思就是说，一般的经济学家那种脑筋直直的经济学家讲说，哦，那个是因为表格那样设计，需要人家去打个勾。那打个勾呢，大家都不愿意打个勾，因为打个勾很费事，所以不打勾，所以大家都不打勾的原因。那他的研究的结果不是这样，他的研究的结果是，并不是因为大家懒得去打勾。也不是因为大家对于别人不关心、不想捐赠器官，在万一自己有什么意外的时候，而是当我们看到那样问题的时候，那种问题太复杂，复杂到我们不知道怎么办，所以我们就不反应。我们不是常常碰到这样的事吗？我们在问小孩讲说：“啊，你现在是怎样？”他点不点？就不会讲了。不会讲的原因不是他不想讲，是他真的不知道怎么回答这个事情。所以这个是。不知所措，那个不勾是两个问题，不管他怎么问，他都。可是设计表格的人呢，可以设计成你不勾就是赞成，那所以右边那个都有一百趴赞成，可是大家都是想我想不出来，所以我就不勾，可是不勾就赞成了
啊，所以这个是这样子的一个概念。We just pick whatever it was that was chosen for us. I'll give you one more example for this. This is from a paper by Redelman and Shafir, and they said, you know, would this effect also happens to experts, people who are well paid, experts in their decisions, do it a lot, and they basically took a group of physicians. And they presented to them a case study of a patient. And they said, here's a patient. He's a 67-year-old farmer. He's been suffering from a right hip pain for a while. And then they said to the physician, yes, you decided a few weeks ago that nothing is working for this patient. All these medications, nothing seems to be working. So you refer the patient to hip replacement therapy. Uh, hip replacement, OK? So the patient is on a path to have his hip replaced. And then they said half the physician, they said yesterday, you review the patient's case and you realize that you forgot to try one medication. You did not try ibuprofen. What do you do? Do you pull the patient back and try ibuprofen or do you let them go and have hip replacement? <laughs> well, the good news is that most physicians in this case decided to pull the patient and try ibuprofen. Very good for the physicians. The other group of the physician, they said, yesterday when you reviewed the case, you discovered there were two medications you didn't try out yet, ibuprofen and piroxicam. They said, you have two medications you didn't try out yet. What do you do? You let them go or you pull them back. And if you pull them back, do you try ibuprofen or piroxicam? Which one? Now, think of it. This decision makes it as easy to let the patient continue with hip replacement, but pulling them back all of a sudden becomes more complex. There's one more decision. What happens now? Majority of the physicians now choose to let the patient go to hip replacement. So, you see, 这个就让他去换髋关节，多数的人都说，请他回来，我要试一下这个药。可是另外一组医生呢，他告诉他说：“哎，你有两种药忘了试，那你是要叫他回来试这两种药呢，还是就让他去换髋关节？”结果大家都说去换吧，差一种啊，就差这么多。这是正式的学术报告，这不是广告的这个吹牛皮的，所以。这个就是要讲，是说，你可以预测出来的非理性决策，我们都可以看得出来。两种药，我就决定让你去换关节，是非理性的决策。可是，居然是专家也在做这种决策。I hope this worries you, by the way,、uh, when you go to see your physician. The thing is that no physician would ever say hip proxicam, ibuprofen, hip replacement, let's go for hip replacement. But the moment you set this as the default, it has a huge power on whatever people end up doing. I'll give you a couple of more examples of irrational decision making. Imagine I give you a choice. Do you want to go for a weekend to Rome, all expenses paid, hotel, transportation, food, breakfast, the continental breakfast, everything, or a weekend in Paris? Now, we can in Paris, we can in Rome, these are different things. They have different food, different culture, different art. Now, imagine I added a choice to the set that nobody wanted. Imagine I said a weekend in Rome, a weekend in Paris, or having your car stolen. <laughs> Now, it's, it's a funny idea, because why would having your car stolen in this set influence anything? <clears throat> But what if the option to have your car stolen was not exactly like this? What if it was a trip to Rome, all expenses paid, transportation, breakfast, but doesn't include coffee in the morning? If you want coffee, you have to pay for it yourself. It's two euros fifty. Now, in some ways, given that you can have Rome with coffee, why would you possibly want Rome without coffee? It's like having your car stolen. It's an inferior option. But guess what happened? The moment you add Rome without coffee, Rome with coffee become more popular, and people choose it. The fact that you have Rome without coffee makes Rome with coffee look superior, and not just to Rome without coffee, even superior to Paris. <clears throat> Here are two examples of this principle. This was an ad from The Economist a few years ago that gave us three choices. An online subscription for $59, a print subscription for $125, or you could get both for $125. <laughs> Now, I looked at this and I called up the economist and I tried to figure out what were they thinking. 
and they passed me from one person to another to another uh, until eventually I, I got to the to a person who was in charge of the website and I, I called them up and they went to check what was going on and the next thing I know the ad is gone and no explanation. So I, so I decided to do the experiment. 经济学人杂志如果登出这个广告你会怎么选择第一个呢叫做说经济学人网站的订阅五十九块美金这个经济学人杂志文本的订阅一百二十五块美金那网站跟这个文本同时订阅也是一百二十五块美金请问会选第一
slightly less attractive. <laughs> the other people, I added an ugly version of Tom. And the question was, will ugly Jerry and ugly Tom help the respective uh, more attractive brothers? And the answer was absolutely yes. When ugly Jerry was around, Jerry was popular. When ugly Tom was around, Tom was popular. <laughs> This, of course, has two uh, very clear implications for, uh, for, for life in general. Um, if you ever go bar hopping, who do you want to take with you? <laughs> <laughs> you, want, you want a slightly uglier version of yourself. <laughs> similar, similar, but slightly uglier. I don't know what 这个男生找女生，女生找男生，最好是带一个比较丑的自己，那所以你就会看起来比较帅，那或者是比较美。但是他问的第二句话，大家就笑不出来了。And and the second point, of course, is that uh, if somebody else invites you, you know how they think about you. <笑> now you're getting. <笑> 如果有人邀请你去。what is the general point? The general point is that when we think about economics, we have this beautiful view of human nature. You know, what a piece of work is man, how noble in reason. We have this view of ourselves, of, of others. Uh, the behavioral economics perspective is slightly less um, generous to people. In fact, in medical terms, that's uh, our view. <laughs> But, but there is a silver lining, and the silver lining is, I think, kind of the reason that behavioral economics is interesting and, and exciting. You know, are we Superman or are we Homer Simpson? Um, when it comes to building the physical world, um, we kind of understand our limitations. Uh, we build steps and we build these things that not everybody can use, obviously, but <coughs> we build them. <coughs> we understand our limitations and we build around it. But for some reason, when it comes to the mental world, when we design things like healthcare and retirement and stock markets, we somehow forget the idea that we're limited. And I think if we understood our cognitive limitations in the same way that we understand our physical limitations, even though they don't stare us in the face in the same way, we could design a better world. And that, I think, is the hope of this thing. Thank you very much. <laughs>这个刚刚的这一段，他因为他也很风趣哈，所以又讲得很好，所以他告诉我们这个让我们自己去想想看，我们真的能够控制自己的决定吗？从刚刚我们在看眼睛看长短，我们大概知道我们常常判断错误，
，同样的这个这些学者在做实验的东西呢，就可以看到说，确实人类很容易受到。外在环境的影响去影响到他所做的决定，所以当我们在做设计的时候，我们就要去了解说，人类的对于思想上面的判断是有极限的。那既然是有极限的时候，我们在挑东西的时候，我们在做设计决策的时候，这些决策就变成有很多很多的思考的方向。那这种思考的方向到底是什么？我们等一下回来再仔细谈。大家先休息一下。我们十分钟以后开始。